The following is a Real Tree Outdoor production. Introducing Real Tree's All Stars of Spring 3 Grand Slam Action. For the next 90 minutes, sit back and enjoy turkey hunting at its finest. As host, Bill Jordan and his All Star panel of guests deliver the excitement. What a great, great turkey. Looking at his beard, uh, that's one thing I could tell. One thing is, you have to remember when a turkey stands out there as gobbling, he's trying to attract him. Every time you make that call to him, that he got Jake just came up and his long beard hung back and he was just pitch perfect. Oh man, what an exciting turkey. And I tell you, we're down here in Encinitas Ranch. Bill Whitfield gave us a call and took Welcome to Real Tree Outdoors, All Stars of Spring 3 video. Hi, I'm Bill Jordan. For over the next hour, you're about to witness some of the most incredible strutting and gobbling action ever recorded on film. This past spring, Team Real Tree traveled and hunted eight different states with some of the world's best turkey hunters and callers. We hunted Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Texas, and even hunted the western states of Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Well, what does this all mean? All Stars of Spring 3 turkey hunting at its best. And speaking of all-stars, joining me today are some of the best turkey hunters and callers in the country who will share their comments and suggestions on how to become a more successful turkey hunter. To my right is Brad Harris, Public Relations Director of Loman Game Calls, two-time and current Grand National Champion, also with Loman, Ricky Joe Bishop, Chris Kirby, current World Turkey Calling Champion of Quaker Boy Calls, Walter Parrott of Night and Hell Game Calls and three-time Grand National Champion, and my old hunting buddy, Joe Drake, former world calling champion and expert hunter from Hunter Specialties. Guys, I've been looking forward to this all year and appreciate you guys being here. Great to be here. Great to be here. I tell you what, I know all of you had a successful spring this year, but um, we had, to, you know, we got 25 hunts on camera this year. We got the best of the best and 16 successful hunts. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, sharing that with our audience today. But uh, Brad, we had a great time, you and Ricky, Joe and I in Florida this past year. We did. I got to go back to Florida. The action was, uh, once you got it cranked up, the action was awesome. It really was. It really was. And, you know, Ricky, I think it was your first time hunting off the Yeah, it was my first trip, mine in Jordan. I'm looking forward to getting back down there. Well, you know, Chris, you and I didn't have an opportunity to successfully have a, you know, hunt on camera. But, uh, had a good time. You had a good time, but your overall hunting this past spring was excellent, wasn't it? Without question. From way up in New York to all the way down here in Georgia, we had a real, real good spring. I tell you, it was a lot of fun. And, and my pal Walter over there and Joe, you know, we hunted the western states this year. We hunted Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and uh, absolutely gorgeous scenery. I think I enjoyed that as much as anything. Some really rugged country. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about your little your hunt, uh, you know, out there. You uh, you up and down those hills pretty good, weren't you? There's several different types of terrain in, in Washington State and uh, also three uh, subspecies of turkeys. Uh, we got in some good fishing, too, though. We got some good fishing, a little few smallmouth there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Joe, how what would you think about the western terrain? Well, it was pretty rough for you know for us us guys around here, the Flatlanders and stuff. Talking about us old guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my> God. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing that. Hey, I'm too. Me and you saying, hey, these I'm young boys about. over here. But uh, there's so much wildlife out there, different stuff that we don't get to see around here. It was just great. I tell you, it was absolutely gorgeous. See all the white-tailed deer and the elk that we saw mixed in a little smallmouth fishing along with the turkey hunting. It was just absolutely bear. superb. Saw some bear. Oh, yeah, saw some bears while we were out there, too. But uh, our first hunt of the video, we uh, we hunted Florida. And, uh, Brad, we're going to go to that right now. We hunted the 90,000-acre Babcock Ranch, and uh, it was quite a treat for us. Great treat. You know, I got out there early in the morning expecting to hear gobblers everywhere, and it was kind of dead that morning, so we had to cover a lot of ground, do a lot of calling. Finally got some things cranked up, and the action got started after the hunt was over. I'll tell you what, we're going to look at those hunts in just a second, but what I'm excited about uh, is we're going to have a kind of a question and answer period with all of you being our expert panel here today, and we've gotten a gr lot of great questions in over the past year, and when we come back, we're going to take a couple of those questions, and I'm going to let you guys fill them, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. But right now, we're going to Florida on three successful turkey hunts, two with a gun with Ricky and Brad and me with a bow. Let's take a look. One of the biggest obstacles awaiting any turkey hunter interested in taking the Grand Slam is simply finding a good place to hunt Osceola's. Well, Bill and Brad and Ricky took a few glances around the vast 90,000 acre Babcock Ranch and wondered still if they could find a place far enough removed from the swamps and its inhabiting creatures to settle back and work a long bearded tom while 10-foot gators rolled in the still dark waters of the cypress swamps. 
faint gobbles could be distinguished throughout parts of the ranch. But this huge piece of real estate, the largest in one block in the state of Florida, did offer the guys some gorgeous scenery and wildlife. And while the native creatures deserved attention, the main attraction, no doubt, would be the Florida Gobbler. After having gobblers hang up out of range on a few occasions, noontime, the first day, found Ricky at the edge of a small field, listening to several turkeys reply to his calling. Hurriedly, Ricky sets out the Jake and Hen decoy, since continuous gobbling revealed that the birds were definitely headed their way. Ricky begins to call aggressively. What he thought was surely a flock of hens and gobblers turned the corner on the far side of the field. A bunch of jakes, with a lone mature bird hanging out with them. Guys, it's a girl. Hey, come on. Hey, wait a minute now. <laughs> you know I've got to strut a little bit, so y'all hold on for a second. A classic scene. The long beard bringing up the rear.
Take them, Ricky. We set up, we called, and thought we heard a gobble. We heard, I thought it might have been a Jake yipping back. And uh, we set up right here at these palms, got the decoys out, and got to hitting them hard. Next thing we know, here come a herd of turkeys. We had four or five Jakes, and this one long beard was in there, what we was looking for, and they put on a good show for us. Often described as more timid and reclusive than their cousins, the Florida Toms upheld that reputation the first couple of mornings, at least as far as Brad was concerned. Still, Brad knew the area held a good number of birds, so being careful not to move too fast and spook some turkeys, Harris began a deliberate assault of yelping and cutting on the Loman box into remote corners of fields. They're coming, they're coming. There's three of them. Finally, at 9.30, Brad receives a cluster of gobbles. They're coming, man. There's three of them. Evidently, this trio's entertainment for the morning had run out on them, probably for the sanctity of her nest. Okay, whoever shows off the most, wins. No one that didn't win. It's quite a show. And Brad is content to witness this rare display of dominance. Unbelievable, Brad. And we just couldn't get out there in the field to get with them so they could see our decoy. So snuck up, set a couple decoys on this road, and I just worked up as close as I could and call real aggressively. And when they start towards me, I'd move back. When I'd move back, they'd quit coming. So I'd get out here and hammer them again from the edge. And finally, we convinced them to come along, and we run back in and set up and, and laid on my stomach. And I tell you, they put on a show. First, the hen come by, and then three dominant gobblers come up and and just just put on a show in front of us and you know it's just one of those great mornings with aggressive calling and, and and staying with it it just paid off what a great morning bill's quest for a grand slam with a bow this spring would definitely be his biggest hunting challenge to date and it had gotten off to a slow start having only called in a few jakes up to now There he is right there. Bill gets yet another response from his tube call and begins to set out the decoys. Working birds had not been a problem on this trip. Getting Jake's within bow range had even been accomplished, though Bill preferred a mature Tom.
But as they say, time was running short. And, well, these jakes looked pretty darn good as they sauntered in for a closer look. Perfectly concealed to draw his bow unnoticed, Bill settles the 20 yard pin. Right through both shoulders. I gave up on them. You know, these, there were three jakes running together, and I'd uh, taken off my head net. It got a little warm, and we were going just about to pick up and leave, and I looked up the, on beyond the field right there, and one of the birds, you know, popped out and did, did, did some soft calling, and they just came right on down, as you saw, and presented me with a good shot. But, uh, well, Bill, it's one chance, down and three to go. Now, here's Matt Moret with this real tree hunting tip. I'm Matt Moret with Hunter Specialties. You know, turkey hunters face one major problem each year when they go to the turkey woods, and that's having turkeys hang up out there, and that's not an uncommon problem. I think that there's a few things that you can do to try to avoid these situations. One thing is, you have to remember when a turkey stands out there as gobbling, he's trying to attract hens. Every time you make that call to him and he gobbles, he cuts your call off, he's trying to have you come to him. And I think what you have to do is just call enough, call sparingly, to get his interest and make him work your way. I think one thing that happens a lot of times as that turkey gets closer, he gets closer and closer to shotgun range, 50, 60 yards out there, people call too loud. You have to remember to control your volume. Just like when you're talking to somebody, you don't want to talk real loud when somebody's right in your face. The same thing is with a turkey. As he comes closer, you might have been calling. He gets in there, you know, 50, 60 yards, and you know you just have to make one more call. Soften that calling down. Soft yelps. Just to keep his interest, maybe a contentment type call like some clucks. Just to let him know where you're at, keep his interest, content him, and hopefully bring him into shotgun range. And that's your Real Tree Outdoors tip of the week. Real Tree's All Stars of Spring 3 is brought to you by Walls, leading the way outdoors. Simmons, your rifle and shotgun scope headquarters. Federal. Makers of high technology ammunition. Field Line, America's finest outfitter. Game Tracker, makers of AFC Carbon Arrows. Hunter Specialties, for sportsmen, by sportsmen. And by Realtree, America's most versatile camo pattern. Tell you what, Ricky and Brad, that was uh, bring back some good memories, doesn't it? Really mm -hmm. does. It was a lot of fun. If those uh, alligators could only gobble. <laughs> they they can. Well, where I was, they could. We saw some big ones, but uh, Ricky, you had a great hunt down there. What did you think about the Babcock Ranch? I tell you, it was great. And I, I enjoyed it a lot. I think everybody had a good hunt down there. We really did, Brad. And your hunt, you had, that was an exciting hunt. That's probably one of our most exciting hunts from the video. Well, you know, it got them excited, but the, hunt, the, the excitement really began after the hunt was over. Right. There it was. And I was real fortunate. I stayed down there an extra day and uh, took one of five birds that we're going to see on the video with a bow, and uh, that was a great hunt for me with a bow, and uh, what a challenge it was. You looked like you had a great hunt, but you know, it just shows you what a well-placed arrow can do. I tell you what, that bird went right down, but uh, that's a challenge about bow hunting I think I really liked, and that's one of five hunts that we have this year with me, and we also have one with Michael Waddell with a bow, but uh, bow hunting for turkeys is just kind of, to me, the ultimate challenge. You know, guys, we have some great questions that have been sent in to us this past year, and uh, We've got brought some of those questions in. You guys are the experts, and I'm going to throw some questions out to you. And uh, Walt is already over there saying, I want to answer. You want them all? You want to answer them all? But we're going to ask a lot of good questions. I tell you, that was what was really neat. But for the questions that we used, Brad, I'm going to get you to help me. Uh, we're going to give all the questions we used today a Team Realtree hat and also this Team Realtree jacket. So we have nine or ten questions today. So all the people whose questions we use will, will get these items. So I hope they enjoy it. But we got some good questions. I'm going to lead off one uh, with us. Let me turn to the letters. This is from Scott Ware of North Muskegon, Michigan. 
and I'll read the question to you guys. I have roosted turkeys one evening and gone back the next morning before light. When I start calling, they answer readily, but went the other way. What is a good way to hunt these birds? Guys, anybody want to take a stab at that? You know, I, we, I have that happen to me all the time. I think you know, everybody does. You know, I think birds coming off the roost are, is probably the most critical time, that first 30 minutes getting the proper setup. But, uh, Chris, how would you hunt those type birds? Chances are they've been, they've been pressured or are with hens. And I like to just slow everything down. Um, after hunting them for two or three days, just kind of get into where I know they're going. Uh, maybe know a flat and tone the calling down and, and just kind of, you got to wait on them. You got to wait till they I turn think, right. I think that's a good point. I know a lot of times when you hunt at heavy pressure areas, uh, you know, a lot of times you mentioned toning down your calling is a very important key because they may have been called too aggressively by other hunters or perhaps even yourself. I think that's a good point. But Joe, let me ask you, on birds going the other way off the roost, uh, what kind of strategies may be involved in that? I'd say maybe 80, 85 percent of the time they they got hens. They either put hens up or they got hens with them and they gobble good on the roost and when they hit the ground they're through right at that particular time. The thing that I like to try to do is, is if I can, if the terrain will let me, is maybe circle them. Try to get in front of them. They're going somewhere. Those hens are going to feed somewhere. And if you can get in front of that flock and call those hens in, those gobblers are going to come in with them. I'd say uh, most of the time they're going to have hens with them. I think your calling can be adjusted to the situation in which you're, what you're doing there. Anybody else right quick? That's if, too great. Too. If it's the beginning of season, if you would go back there and listen to that turkey three or four or five different times, you might be able to pattern him, pattern that bird, you know, and see that he's going to go that way. That's right. And you can put yourself in the right spot. That's, that's a great point right I've there. I've used a crow call, quit turkey calling, use a crow call or something to get them to gobble at and move around and get position on them without using a turkey call will help a lot. Tell you what, that's some great information right there, guys. And i tell you what let's do. Let's go to question number two. And this is from James Edwards of Glenshaw, Pennsylvania. How true is it when calling for turkeys always to try to call them uphill? What is it, Ricky, about calling turkeys up here? What, what do you like to do in that kind of strategy? Well, if you're in terrain where you are up in hilly country, it is better to be uphill, I think, because uh, a turkey likes to pitch off the roost where he's got a view, of, a downhill view, where he can see things approaching him. Right. So if you have the option to get above the turkey, it is better. Right. But sometimes, like we was in Florida, we didn't have any hilly country, so the turkey's got to go somewhere, so just stay with them. Walt, what about the Missouri Hills and some of the stuff we hunted out west this year? You got any kind of special techniques for calling turkeys uphill? A lot of times, like a gobbler will establish a strutting area on a, on a point or a flat, and I like to, myself, I like to be at least even with him or above him if I can get up to that. Yeah, a lot point. of times, too, too, with your strategy, if you know particular strutting zones, a lot of times you can kind of go ahead and set up in there. Well, that's some great answers right there, guys. And we're going to ask, ask more questions as the, as the video goes on. But we got four great hunts coming up from uh, Eastern Birds from this past year. we got our good friend Harold Knight with Night and Hell Game Calls. Joe will hunt with you. And you also accompanied Trip Mitchell on a hunt. And then uh, I have another bow hunt on there that we're going to see. So let's do this. Let's take a look at four Eastern hunts coming up next. The Georgia Dawn unveils the sweet sounds that every turkey hunter dreams of experiencing. Let's listen as Joe revs up several eager toms. Wow. This hunt's already a success, and Joe has not laid eyes on the first feather. Uh, not yet, anyway.
Believe it or not, calling in a mature tom right off the roost with barely enough light to film is a rare occasion for the real tree team. into a bunch of gobblers here. There's four or five gobblers along this creek bottom and got on them still in the roost. This turkey flew down, gobbled four or five times for us over there before he strutted in. You're talking about something that worked good. Once he got out there, he strutted pretty good, as you can see. I think the turkey's probably a two-year-old gobbler. He didn't gobble a lot. There's one back over on the ridge that's doing a lot of gobbling. You know, the way Joe's whispering, he's think he's got plans for the bird across the creek. Uh, that's the reason he just uh, strutted and displayed for us and wouldn't, wouldn't gobble much once he got into view here when that other one got to gobbling so hard. Joe accompanies Trip Mitchell on an early season hunt on Trip's property in Alabama. You know, three's a crowd. Throw in a cameraman and you've got standing room only. Trip, a longtime friend of the real trade team, wastes no time putting them right in the middle of a wad of turkeys. Trip's caught, and he can't swing the gun around. This hunt is pretty much self-explanatory.
how close are they going to get? What do you think, partner? Congratulations. <laughs> Great morning. Great oh, morning. man, we're talking about a wad of turkeys Ooh, on top man. of you quick. Yeah, I never expected have... to see six or seven come around the corner. Well, we had to move. That little yeah. old stump was great, too. This great all-purpose yeah. boy it blended in great with it's, that old really stump is. right there. And we had to switch around there. They come so yeah. quick. quick. They, they went to the right a little bit quicker yeah. on me than I thought. And kind I thought, of set up wrong. But... Yeah, we we fixed that real quick. It all worked, it worked out man. good, boy, but... Yeah. Only one thing, 10 yards is a little bit close. It's mighty close. It's, you really got to put that bead on them. To, you don't have much room to make it. No, right. you'll, you'll miss them. But you did great, buddy, and I appreciate being here with well, you. I enjoyed it. Bill traveled to western Tennessee to hunt with old friends Harold Knight and David Hale to experience some charged up gobbling like he's heard about for years from his two buddies. <laughs> But our hunters wasted no time working in a gorgeous gobbler onto this ridge top. Now the subtle yelp seemed to aggravate the bird. As David put it, there won't be no power calling today. Still, he wouldn't give up any ground. As the tom drifted over the ridge and out of sight, a strategic move had already been planned. With Harold and David knowing the land so well, home court advantage belonged to both hunters and prey. The gang has quietly circled a small group of birds and reached a point where Harold feels the turkeys will travel. <laughs> they appear. The dominant bird struts in the back. The thick brush prevents Harold from shooting. As the birds leave, David pulls on the string attached to the motion hen decoy. Just a little calling is all the hunters will try on these wary gobblers. The movement stops the Longbeard in a clear lane for Harold to shoot. Great hunt, fellas. How do we actually decide this morning who's going to shoot? How, how come he got drawn to shoot? Well, I tell you what, Bill, I'm, I've been the uh, decoy string jerker now for about two weeks. I can't get out of it. You heard him admit he's a jerk. <laughs> he, he had me up there clipping brush down in front of him, so that was my job this morning. I've but gotten I, to the point where all I want to do is be there. I, well, I hey, me too. But you know, you know, I, I tell you how this morning's hunt. Uh, you know, we're up here at y'all's home and uh, hunting actually in Tennessee, not too far from y'all's y'all's home. But I think a lesson that I even learned this morning, I'm telling you, you know, is we set up on these birds, uh, heard them off the roost, went to them, couldn't get in the proper situation of, uh, you know, getting them down to as far as in, in filming or even getting them close to us to shoot. But you backed off on your calling. 
And I, I think that's something that we knew the birds were there. It was soft calling, and it wasn't a whole lot of calling at that. What did I tell you last night? I said, if there's three of us here trying to hunt, we're not going to do no power calling, and we didn't. No, not at no, all, and it worked. At this stage of the game, you don't have to, yeah. and you have to do just enough. And if you notice, we uh, mixed up our calling. David come after that little push and pull, and man, was I glad to hear that just a little bit over from me, because I knew that that'd get their attention. And uh, they, of course, they saw the decoy, and, uh, and they came right up to came it. Came right up to it, I tell you. After plenty of frustrating encounters with long beards on his own hunting land, Bill realizes his second bird in the slam, the Eastern, is not going to be easy. Time again is getting low, since Texas is next on the agenda. So, with persistence, Bill ignores the cloudy, rainy, and windy conditions this particular morning. The game plan? Set out the decoys in a highly visible spot and call regularly with some volume to combat the wind. Bill begins to yelp on the HS strut triple glass. Obviously, gobbling activity would be almost non-existent, but cameraman David Blanton knew that birds were in the area. Soon enough, a couple of jakes silently wander in as a hard gobbling bird cranks up in the distance and heads away from the hunters. Unfortunately for the jakes, the gobbling continued out of hearing. Good shot, Bill. Oh, I think we're a good hit. Oh, I think I heard it. Flopping over here somewhere. Oh, look what I see. My second bird on the way to a grand slam this season with Buck. Oh, there he is. I thought I heard him over here. Oh, man. Ooh, my excited. Am I excited? Made a good hit. Exactly where I was shooting for right there. Didn't go far. Bird kind of pitched up and, uh, oh, I guess maybe came 80, 90, maybe 100 yards, but uh, I'm excited about this bird. Tell you what, we did uh, this morning. David Bland's been coming in here and, and uh, roosting a couple of birds and actually came in here one morning this week and we came right back in the same place where he'd. Uh, Heard some birds, and, and daggum, the wind's uh, probably blowing 15, 20 miles an hour, and did not hear a bird off the roost this morning. And so we just kind of did a little deer hunting tactic this morning. We uh, just kind of set up, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, had a glass call, and went ahead and struck it a couple of times. Birds gobbled around us, and uh, had a big bird came up behind us. And I looked out in the middle of the field, and uh, here come a couple of Jake's, and uh, but I tell you, with a bow nonetheless, I'm uh, I'm happy to get him. But this is my second bird toward the uh, hopefully a grand slam, uh, you know, this year. Now introducing Real Tree's new all-purpose gray camouflage. 
Look closely. This is a test. How many hunters in Realtree's all-purpose gray camo do you see? There are four different hunters in the picture. One, two, three, four. But don't worry. They can't see you either. Ask for Realtree all-purpose at your sporting goods dealer. Joe, does that kind of bring back some good memories for you? Some awful good memories. If, you know, as you could see that the turkeys work well, and uh, he, he wasn't the dominant gobbler in that bottom that morning. You could, you know, as right. you could hear, he hushed and was strutting around the decoy, and that the big boy was across the creek, you know, with his hands and stuff. But still, it was, it was a great hunt. You, Trip had a good hunt too with you, with, you know, you with being with him. That kind of caught us. We was all messed up with that hunt. We set up wrong and had to switch positions real quick because the turkeys got around us and. Looked up the road and here they all came. And, and they came too, didn't they? And there was a tree there and the hen darted in front of Trip. And I said, whoa, don't wait, wait, wait. And the gobbler come up there and it was, it was a super hunt. hunt, you know, real close. Well, we had some good hunts with Harold and David, uh, you know, up in Tennessee in the hills. And, uh, of course, you're talking about two masterful woodsmen when you talk, you know, hunt with Harold and David. Yeah. I enjoyed that. And uh, I had a good, uh, you know, bow hunt, you know, back home. But I found it a little bit difficult hunting at home. Uh, early part of the year, Ricky, you know, you and I run into this in Georgia. Had no foliage on the trees. It made you know bow hunting a little bit more difficult for me. It is tough. It really, you know, when they when they can see well and you don't have much to hide behind it, you you're at a disadvantage. There's no doubt about it. It, it is hard to do. Well, let's do this. Let's go to the next questions. And this question comes from Tim Reeves of New Edinburgh, Arkansas. Great question right here. I have taken several turkeys with a shotgun. Now I would like to try and bow hunting them. What type of broadhead and arrow combination do you recommend? And where is the perfect placement for an arrow? I tell you, that's some good stuff right there. And, and I tell you, people have not tried bow hunting before. It's a, it's a challenge. And, Brad, I'll just ask you this. What kind of broadhead perhaps do you use in arrow combination? Well, you know, but I don't change any of my uh, equipment from deer hunting or elk hunting or anything else. I use the same equipment I shoot uh, for those animals I do for turkeys. And uh, I shoot just a standard broadhead. I shoot a, a, just a three-blade replaceable broadhead. And uh, and I just concentrate on shot placement. You know, when you're shooting a deer, you're shooting at a, big, a bigger area when you're shooting a turkey you should be shooting at something the size of a grapefruit and you need to remember that the arrow needs to be up high you proved that on some of these shots when you hit the bird in the right place there's no tracking involved i tell you you know i think it's real critical right there is getting the right shot taking the right drawback on the birds because i find it harder to draw back on birds than i, than I do actually you know deer and uh, especially when you got several you know turkeys around you and ricky i know that you bow hunt some too yeah, I tell you, using a little bit lighter poundage with your equipment will help because a lot of times you're in an awkward position and it'll help when you're drawing the ball when you, uh, bow when you're sitting or either in a kneeling position. And I think like you're saying too, you know, if you're comfortable sitting on the ground or I know I take a little stool that I sit on, you know, where I can sit comfortable because I'm used to shooting sitting down. But I guess the key thing is, is just practice the, the way that you want the shot to be done. Exactly. Well, I tell you what, let's go to the next question right here. And this is from Blake Roy of Manchu, Louisiana. And this is a great uh, often asked question. What is the best number of shot for taking turkeys? And of course, that's the number of shots, you know, for as your shotgun. Chris, I'm going to let you answer that. What do you prefer for as a proper shot? As far as a proper shot, you, you've got to get a sampling and, and find out which is going to shoot best out of your gun. Um, I like to use two ounce fives. It just a gives me a real good dense pattern at 25, 30 yards. But if sixes, you're comfortable with that. Um, it's a combination. It's right. a combination of the manufacturer of the shell and the, and the shotgun and the whole nine yards. Joe, I know that you like a lot of times use four shot even sometimes. And maybe is that your number one shot that what you like? It patterns well out of my gun. And uh, you, sometimes you get a little more range with a four, you know, 30, 35 yards. Sometimes, you know, you have the longer shots. And I think the fours work better at, at longer ranges than the six. It's just got more knockdown power, and that's what I like about the fours. You know, a good, a good way to pattern your gun is to get a few of your buddies and buy some, some of the 10 packs that are on the market now, different brands and different uh, shot size, and, and get you some paper targets. That way, it's, you know, the cost is a minimum. You get four or five of you and trade shells and have a patterning and, session. And that's a, that's a good point. I tell you, target uh, practice with that gun is very important, whether it be your bow or your gun, but uh, knowing how that shot is going to place at that critical time is very important. And, Self-confidence in your mind, yeah. Absolutely. Lots of confidence in there. The problem is shooting too far. Too. Yeah. You, you know, get you a tree out there 30, 35 yards and make sure that that bird's in, you know, inside that before you... Know your ability, what your gun can exactly do. Exactly right. 
I tell you what, going now, guys, we're going to Texas. It's one of our favorite places. Uh, we hunt Texas each year for Rio's, and we hunt the Encinitas Ranch, which is a fun ranch for us, both in deer hunting and turkey hunting. And, Yo, you know, you've been down there several times with us, and what we're going to do now is we got two bow hunts from Turkey and one black powder, uh, you know, hunt from down there with Jerry Martin. So what we're going to do right now is take you to te South Texas on the Rio hunt. If you've followed the Realtree team the past few seasons, then the Encinitas Ranch in South Texas has become a familiar place. This 45,000 acre ranch is loaded with Rio Grande turkeys. And as Michael Waddell is about to find out, sometimes the long beards just don't cooperate. They're hot. <laughs> Two adult toms skirt around Michael just out of bow range. And finally, after the big boys are gone, these jakes work up enough courage to check out the decoys. Coming to full draw on an alert turkey is so difficult. Take him. Oh, perfect going away shot. Now let's take another look in slow motion. The arrow strikes the bird in the back, entering the vitals, and remains in the jake. All the while, the broadhead does lethal damage. I wasn't sure exactly how many turkeys in the group. We knew there were several gobblers. We set up away from the turkeys and uh, just like clockwork, the turkeys come into the call and got to the decoys and strutted around. The long beards run the jakes clean out of the pitcher and then they gobble clean out of the pitcher. And, uh, and it wasn't long, the jakes come working back and presented me with a good shot and I was able to make a good shot on the turkey. And I tell you, any turkey with a bow is a real, is a real trophy. This is also the stop where Bill hopes to successfully harvest the third leg of the Grand Slam. The majority of the gobblers showed little interest in coming to the call. They were simply hand up and followed their female company wherever they went. However, with Bill calling persistently, a two-year-old subordinate Tom drifts away from the flock for some company of his own. Warily, the bird approaches the feather flex decoy. Hidden in the tangle of mesquite, Bill is able to bring the bow to full draw. The tri-lock broadhead enters the tom high in the back, passing through the top of the vitals. He won't go far. I could tell it was fairly thick, you know, when uh, he was coming up, but probably appears to be 10 and a half, maybe 11 inches long. Got great spurs. I hope you can see these spurs. Got some good spurs on him. Just a real, real pretty bird. Had a kind of a cordon away shot from where I was sitting and, 
and uh, look like it may have busted this wing a little bit. But I am very proud of a Rio Grande with a bow. Well, Bill, the slam is looking pretty good. Jerry Martin has hunted turkeys all over the country, and his experience shows in locating a workable gobbler from long distance with his box call. On this hunt, Jerry's elected to go with a black powder shotgun. Talk about working a bird. Let's watch. After initially playing hard to get, the Longbeard finally breaks into the clear. How's that for a smoke pole hunt? Boy, it's a nice, real grand bird. This is the first real grand bird I've killed with a muzzle loading shotgun. These birds have been giving us just real fits for a couple days. This bird this morning, we heard him gobble early. There was some more gobble further back. They seemed to fly down and kind of head toward each other and they started a strut path or started traveling one direction and kind of came back. And uh, we had to cover a lot of ground and got fairly close to this bird set up on it. And, uh, put a decoy out and, and uh, it gobbled and strutted along strut path there for quite a while and just stayed so we just shut up. Didn't call for quite a long time and he started coming, he'd come right on in. Well, Bill, that was a fantastic bow hunt. I tell you what, Brad, that was a great hunt. Uh, good long beard bird, uh, came in by himself, and once I saw him commit coming into me, I didn't make another call. And, of course, the decoys took over a little bit, and he came right in. But Michael Waddell had a great hunt, too, with a bow. And, uh, you know, good hunt there. And Jerry Martin with the black powder. Uh, Texas is always a great place to go. Chris, I know you hunt Texas a lot. Texas is a lot of fun. You're going to hear a lot of gobbling in Texas, that's for sure. I think that's one of the neatest things, Joe, when we've been down in years past. Is, is all the turkeys that you get into, and, and rattlesnakes sometimes. There's lots of rattlesnakes, and lots of gobblers, though. The gobblers make it worth it. It really does. Well, we're going to continue on with some of our question and answer period in here, and the next question comes from Dennis Boaz from Simpson, Illinois. And this is the question for you guys. This past season, the birds would gobble before flying down off the roost. However, after they came down, they would shut up. They would still strut. I could see them, but they would not gobble. Why? That's kind of... Brad, I'll tell you what, I'll let you start off with that right there. Well, you know, a gobbler attracts hens two ways. One is gobbling, and the other one's strutting. 
And a lot of times he gobbles, he's attracting hens or showing his dominance. And when he gets hens close to him, he'll quit gobbling and go to strutting to pull them on in or to show his dominance. So that's one reason. I tell you, it's kind of frustrating sometimes, even when you lose sight of the birds. You know, you know the birds in a general area and they're not gobbling. And Chris, I'm going to ask you, I know there's a lot of good calls in the market for us. Uh, let's just say they aren't answering, uh, you know, regular hen talk or cutting to or whatever. How do you keep up with that bird when you lose him out of sight? You can use a number of different things. Uh, you can go to a crow call. Uh, I, I'd like to use a gobble shaker, challenge them into getting a gobble out of them. Um, anything really to, to, to keep them gobbling. Let's I mean, do this. Let's, let's take just a second. Uh, uh, which one of you got a, uh, a crow call? And let's look at that. And maybe a woodpecker call and maybe even the gobble. And this, this is a situation where maybe we lost contact with him. We don't see him, but we're trying to keep up with him. How about, uh, Chris, won't, let me let you start off with a gobble tube there. All right, that, again, this is just you're going to challenge them into gobbling. You're, you're trying to say, hey, I'm coming in and try to take your hens away. And a lot of times he'll just respond back just not knowing, just a shot gobble yep. to him. Brad, I tell you what, you got a crow call right there. How about showing some a situation on that? To how would you use that crow call? Well, you want to just keep it short and sweet. Don't run through a long scenario of calls. Hit it two or three notes and loud and sharp. <laughs> And just listen. And you can do that as you go and proceed into that gobbler. And I know a lot of times hunting with you over the years, a lot of times you use that crow call quite a bit until you get in a situation where you actually want to sit down and start calling right. to him. Right. How about a woodpecker call there, Ricky? A woodpecker call works good. Now, I like to use a crow call preferably, but as a backup, I'll use a pelleted woodpecker when I'm in a 70 to 100 yard range, you know, and keep him in check with that. And you just blow it sharp. A lot of times they'll respond right back to that. Rick, I tell you what, that's a real good sharp sound right there. That sounds great. Well, let's do this. Let's move on to the next question. This question comes from Carrie Lambring of Brownstown, Indiana. The question is this. This past season, I would hear lots of gobbling one morning and none the next, yet I knew they were still there. Does weather affect gobbling activity? I think we all know it has a little bit to do with it. Joe, I'll let you start off with that. With uh, barometric pressure, either rising or falling has a, a great deal to do with it, not only with turkey, but deer and everything else, as we all know. So everybody's been in that situation where you've been hunting one day, and there's four or five gobblers in there, go back the next day, bring your buddy, man, I'm into them, go back there, and what? Nothing. Right. Same kind of weather. Same, everything the same. You know, Walter, you and I see it in Missouri. We got a lot of birds. A good morning, and boy, one turkey, you get another one going. Next thing you know, you hear 20. And, you know, you just go back there, and it's like, right. man, we're going to kill them tomorrow, and they're done. It's kind of like going to a football game and screaming for your kid for six hours, you know, or four hours, whatever. You don't feel like screaming the next day. Yeah. So what you're yeah, saying, they're gobbled out a little bit. Yeah. He can have some hens gathered up also, and a, and a lot of times right. if a bird roosts with hens, he won't gobble even on a limb. He'll just fly down and start displaying. But don't give up hunting there. No. You know those turkeys are there. Don't, right. don't, don't, don't let gobbling get in your head and worry about gobbling. Right. Slip right in there and sit down and sit up and hunt right and there. follow up on that point a little bit, too. A lot of times when hen maybe goes nest later in the morning, it's a good time for that gobbler to come back out searching for more hens. So, uh, That's right, 9 or 10 o'clock yeah, in the morning. 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, you, you, morning, you, you may be in the catbird seat, so don't give up your hunting That's right. Well, let's do this, guys. We're going to our next hunts, and these are hunts that uh, Walter, you and Joe and I were on. This was in the state of Washington, and we had some great hunts out there. We did have some great hunts. We had, beautiful, a, hard, beautiful we had a hard time getting started, though. <laughs> yeah, but we all got one. Well, what are we going to do now? We're going to go to Washington and show you three great hunts on Miriam turkeys. Let's take a look. Man, that's a hill there. <laughs> got a few of them around here. <laughs> Man, I'm from Missouri, but that, that's, a, that's a hill right there, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Man. Whoa, 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 there he is. He just don't know what. This adult gobbler's content in his strutting zone, trying to attract hens. I don't see anything with him. Man. No, he's just giving us a show here. He's going back down to the canyon. I'll tell you what, they're heading up the canyon. We need to... We need to get back down and try to see if we can get above them a little bit. Okay. We need to stay off the side here so we don't break out in this field. Okay. While high. the landscape was splendid, the hilly, rugged terrain made the task of lugging 60 pounds of camera gear around a feat in itself. There he was. The pileated woodpecker call gets a response from the bird. Let's set the decoys up over here. And Okay. 
getting above him would increase Dan and Walter's odds. Hopefully, the bird would come uphill, where he can't see the source of the calling. Hopefully, he would then see the decoys once he's on the same level. Tom breaks from his strutting ground and begins to close the gap. Hard-earned gobbler. Oh, I really enjoyed seeing that. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, inviting us out to your beautiful and rugged state of Washington. <laughs> yeah, well, it's rugged, and I think uh, you ran us around a little bit, but you're always welcome. Glad you could come out. And... The following morning, Bill opts to take his shotgun for the first time this season. Right off the bat, Bill's first yelps are answered with a couple of aggressive gobbles. Bill sets out the decoys, hoping the birds follow the terraced hillside around into close range. The two gobblers have other things on their mind as they circle uphill and behind Bill. As the birds momentarily dip out of sight, Bill quickly readjusts his position. The only thing Bill can see is an occasional glimpse of the glowing white on the top of the turkeys' heads. Meanwhile, the cameraman is enjoying quite a show. Finally, Bill gets a clear shot. It's just an unbelievable day. We checked the place right off at daylight this morning. The bird should have been on roost. We roosted a bird yesterday and couldn't get him cranked up, moved down just a little ways and got on two birds, but uh, it was a great morning. Nice Miriam. Next stop in Washington is the southeast corner of the state where the Rio Grandes are thriving and where Joe hopes to fill his first Washington turkey tag. <laughs> 
think we'd better put our money on Joe. After getting a response from what sounded like a group of gobbling birds from the valley, Joe settles in to begin working them. Probably a bunch of hand-up toms giving an occasional courtesy gobble. After a solid hour, Joe can tell by the sound of the gobble that a lone bird has finally had enough and decided to investigate. A sudden full fan signals the arrival of a mature longbeard. That's what you call over the shoulder. Let's take another look in slow motion and watch as the wadding almost hits the bird. An incredible hunt and a case for aggressive calling. Now, here's Walter Parrott with this real tree hunting tip. Hi, I'm Walter Parrott in the beautiful state of Washington. I'm with Scott Raceley from the Game and Fish Department. And Scott, would you tell us a little bit about this uh, landowner hunter relationship you've got going here? Uh, what we've got is a, uh, in this particular program, is our hunting by written permission program. It's a successful program throughout the state of Washington. And it rates right up there with our Feel Free to Hunt and our Register to Hunt program. We got just a little over a million acres in the state of Washington in this program. And uh, Probably the best tip I can give, Walter, to the hunters out there is, uh, is when you're out hunting these programs or gun clubs or anywhere you go, uh, I think uh, it, it would be in the best of the hunter's interest to, to obey the game laws and to assist the hunter with his chores. Uh, don't hurt their fences. Uh, don't drive in their crops. And uh, always be courteous. Treat it like it's your own land. Not only for the state of Washington, but any state in the United States and any hunter, that applies. That's, that's some great rules there. You need to make sure you don't tear their fields up, don't ride their fences down, and if you get a chance, help them with some of their chores. That way you can have a good re working relationship with, with the landowner and uh, ensure your uh, hunting rights for years to come. I agree. That, uh, just follow those simple rules. It's just common courtesy, and you'll have many places to hunt in the future. That sounds like a great project. Thanks, Scott. I'm Walter Parrott. That's your Real Tree Outdoors Tip of the Week. Real Tree Outdoors All Stars of Spring 3 is brought to you by Motorola. Have fun, stay in touch. Purina, high pro dog food for birds, not excuses. 10X, an American tradition since 1934. Rocky Boots, at home on any turf. Wellington Outdoors makers of Ben Lee and Tink's hunting products. Crossman, number one in American air power. And by Realtree, America's most versatile camo pattern. Joe, that was absolutely a fantastic hunt. I know you had a heart be pounding when that tail feather came up over that ridge. Well, you can imagine right out of sight gobbling two or three times and then you just see the, the fan kind of get thrown up in your face and he was there. We hunted hard for that turkey. It was a good hunt though. That's just a lot of fun. And uh, yours was a great hunt too, Walter. It, uh, I know you had to move on that bird a couple of times. I'll tell you what, physically that's probably one of the toughest, if not the toughest turkey hunt I've ever been on in that mountainous area. And we had to, we just kept parallel on that turkey. We finally got ahead of him and uh, worked out real got well. Got where he wanted to go. Exactly. And we had a great hunt too. That bird, uh, we got on two birds off the roost and they must have gobbled 150 times. We couldn't show it all on the length of time with the hunt, but uh, those birds gobbled like crazy. But moving on guys, we got a couple of more questions and they're great questions. And uh, I'll just say, uh, Chris, you're up on this one. <laughs> you don't even know what it is yet. We've got a great question for you. And this is from Chris Casey of Martinez, Georgia. 
Have you ever taken a Grand Slam, and what is the difference between a Grand Slam and a Super Slam? And let me answer that first. A Grand Slam, obviously, is related to turkey hunting, and a Super Slam is, that, is more animals, you know, big game hunting. Correct. But there are other type slams in association with turkey there hunting. Are, there are. The, the Grand Slam is the uh, Rio Grande, the Miriams, the Osceola, and the Easterns. Then you would move into a Royal Slam, which would include those four, plus uh, you'd have to travel to Mexico for a Goulds. And then the World Slam, you would move into the Yucatan Peninsula for the uh, Oscillated, which is a much different looking bird. Right. That's so where we're going next. I think it is. <laughs> we're in Mexico next year. <laughs> we are going. That's, that's great. You know, we've, uh, and I think just about everybody here has, uh, you know, has participated in a, in a Grand Slam, you know, for us turkeys. And, you know, I'm looking forward to us all going next year, several of us going to Mexico for the goose. And I don't know about going to South America for the, for the other one, but we'll just see. I mean, maybe in the mind, in your lifetime. Well, we might. you know, we might leave Walter and and Joe, Joe here, but you know, they could go. Yeah, you know, they, they, just, they just had this habit of showing <laughs> up every now and then. Okay, guys, here's the next question. And this comes from Dan Fitzer of Omak, Washington. Do you use decoys? If so, what do you think about using a Jake decoy? Also, when should you not use a decoy? Walter, I'll tell you what, I'll let you start off with that question. I'll tell you, I, I use a uh, decoy a lot, especially in the open areas such as fields, Texas, and the western states work great, and I always use a Jake decoy with a hen. All right. Brad, what about you? Well, that jake is certainly an attractor. The gobbler, a lot of times, will walk right by the hen and go straight to that jake to put him in his place. Right. That's true also. Yeah. But a, a reason why you wouldn't use it is, you know, when the foliage gets up here and, you know, a little later on into turkey season, if they, if they don't see it, they won't come to it. So unless you're around some fields or something like that, you know, pastures or something like that, you know, you're just wasting your time. If they don't right. see it, they're not coming. Right. I tell you what, I hunt in New York a lot, and we get a lot of pressure. And if you're hunting an area where you got a lot of pressure and a lot of guys are using decoys, try to change it up and just use something different. And yeah, we do get a lot of pressure up in New York. All right. One thing you might want to check, though, is your local game laws because a lot of states don't allow decoys. So be you sure know, to check that. That's true for you and Joe and I. You know, we can use decoys in Georgia and our neighboring state, Alabama, you can't. So that's a good point of always checking with local state game laws, you know, about uh, the use of decoys. I tell you what, Ricky, that's some great information right there. What we're going to do now, we're going to go to three hunts, two bow hunts coming up, and another good friend of ours, Rob Keck with the National Wild Turkey Federation. These hunts are from Idaho and Oregon. Let's take a look. With an invitation from a good friend in Idaho who had been seeing plenty of turkeys on his land, Bill hopes to complete the slam with a good Merriam gobbler. Knowing where these birds were roosting was valuable information, as Bill had their attention soon after fly-down. Looks like a long beard and several jakes. As Bill comes to full draw, the birds get spooky. He's down. A closer look reveals the broadhead entering through the neck, slicing the juggler. No wonder he didn't go far. What a feat, Bill. The grand slam with a bow and arrow. Oh, All well. captured through the lens of the camera. I just wish he knew how excited I was right now. This is absolutely fantastic. This just completes this hunting season, the Grand Slam, the four subspecies of turkeys, and this is my Miriam bird. And I never realized he was as good a bird as he was, but I am I excited?
The game-rich state of Oregon is the Realtree team's last stop of the year. And with such a healthy and thriving population of Rio Grandes, originally relocated from Texas, there will be hopefully more hunts in the future. And with his Grand Slam complete, Bill continues on with a challenge of bow hunting. Hen yelps fill the air as the turkeys approach. A surprising number of mature gobblers still together this late in the season. Having no idea which bird Bill has his sights on, the cameraman stays wide to include all the toms. Another good hit, with the arrow remaining in the bird. They're actually, you know, crossing that creek, you know, at the, uh, at the little area right there. So actually, it's just a great funnel to bring the, you know, the birds across to get on the other side of the creek, so they have to fly it. But, you know, let me tell you what happened this morning. It was, it was absolutely fantastic. We knew where the birds were roosting. We came in here and roosted them last night. And, and uh, got in here real early this morning for, for actually for fly down time set up the decoys and uh, yesterday when we were in here we, from that hillside up there you can see these decoys right where they are from 100, you know, 125 yards out and that's exactly what happened this morning when the birds finally did see the uh, decoys down here they just came on a string and I don't know how many gobblers it was it was a lot of them Sightings of big, strutting toms in Oregon were a common occurrence. However, for Rob, the birds, while answering the calls, refused to leave their female company. Getting a long beard into range would take some strategic maneuvering. On the last afternoon, after hunting hard all morning, Rob spots a group of gobblers making their way down a distant fence line. Shortly, 
the birds appear, still continuing their course of direction. Way to go, Rob. Sometimes, instead of depending on the turkeys to come to the call, you have to go to them. Boy, these turkeys just have not responded very well to a call. They've been henned up, and it seems like every time you yelp to a hen, they just take those adult gobblers just further away. This morning, early, we had 17 juvenile gobblers and two adults and two hens. I've never seen such a group of uh, gobblers together in the spring. That goblin sound was just beyond compare. But the hens, they controlled the whole situation. I don't think it matters whether you hunt Rio Grandes, Miriams, Easterns, or Floridas. The hen controls the gobbling, and it really controls whether those turkeys are coming in or not. Fortunately, in this situation, we saw several adult gobblers, a few jakes, and there was one adult gobbler that was strutting with all these hens. We thought there's a chance we might be able to pry away one of these adults, and luck was with us. The thing that's really amazing, it's just about quarter to one in the afternoon. A lot of people by this time of day would give up. Gobbling activity just diminished, but sticking with it, you'll find a lot of times those hens will leave the gobblers, and you can have some great tom hunting up in the day and late in the day. That's two great bow hunts, wasn't it? Tell you what, Joe, it was a great hunt. I love, you know, hunting out west. That completes a couple of things for you, doesn't it? Like a grand slam with a bow? Well, I tell you what, I tell you, all my bow hunting I've done for a number of years, that's uh, my first time, you know, especially nice to capture it on camera, but uh, it was a great challenge for me. You know, we all hunt, we all bow hunt, and uh, being able to take a grand slam was kind of special this year. But Rob Keck had a great hunt with us, too, and, you know, out in Oregon, and uh, Walter, we even got into some fishing out there. I tell there. you what, my arms were just stiffened up and tight enough from catching those uh, shad in that Umpqua River. It was unbelievable. I think it was unbelievable and um, you know something too, a lot of the places that we hunted this past year, we'll have a name and number at the end of the show that people can get these places if they too want to try you know some turkey hunting and same thing you know far as the uh, fishing but uh, great year all the way around and guys what I'd like to do now is close this segment by uh, maybe picking a favorite call that you guys like and Walter I want to start with you. I, I know you got an owl hooter right there. Okay, this is just a readout hooter. What I'm going to do, it's a locator call early in the morning situation for, for turkey hunting. Eight no owl hoot. <laughs> Hope you can get that old gobbler to answer that. Maybe not. You can get one of the local owls to start hooting, and you can concentrate on locating a bird. Uh, a little later in the morning, you use a crow call. You know, locator calls are a big part of turkey hunting. That's it, it really is. And guys, what I'd like for you to do, Joe, starting with you, is pick maybe perhaps your favorite call that you like to do and maybe show us some hen yelps and maybe a little exotic you know, cuts in there with it. And uh, how about you doing that with us on a mouth call? Okay, we'll, we'll see if we can get started with some uh, hen yelps and go into some cuts. Try to get the old gobbler fired up a little bit. See what got me fired up over here? <laughs> they sound good. Chris, how about you? What kind of call would you like to show us? Everybody always likes to hear the turkey gobble. It's without question. That's what we're out here, out there to do. And recent years, I've been using the box call, just really cutting and yelping real hard, just getting them real cranked up, like Joe said. And you, you get them cranked up and gobbling, it gets the heart pumping, and everybody <laughs> likes to hear that. Just really get some hammering. I tell you what, that's a real high pitch on that call you too. Bet. And I tell you, that sounds great too. Ricky, how about you? 
I like to use a slate. It's real high pitched too, and it's got a lot of realism in the woods. And turkeys respond real well to it sometimes. Right. And I can yelp and cut on it. A lot of times, that's all it takes. I tell you what, well, that does sound good. Brad, how about the uh, showing us maybe one of your favorite calls? Well, you know, Bill, you hunted me enough to know that I use a box call a bunch. And, you can't and use I like it, you hit them over the head with That's it. right. You know, you can throw it at them if they don't come to it. So, But it's the same way. And I like high-pitched ring and raspy calls in the woods. And it's, it's what sounds natural, and it makes turkeys gobble. Well, it does sound good. Pretty simple. It really is simple. And, you know, I think out of all this, you know, Joe, you're picking a mouth call and box calls and slates and there are other type calls out there. You know, one thing I've learned over the years of hunting with a lot of you guys is not just take one call to the woods, take, you know, two or three calls and learn to use them all. And, uh, and I tell you what, because there are certain days that one call, you know, works better than another. Sure. That's right. Well, guys, we're looking forward to next spring. Uh, I know we'll have an opportunity to all hunt again once together and uh, uh, keep those turkey calls ready. And, you and I are going after the goose next year. That's right. Leaving Walter and Joe at home. Well, you know, Joe has this. They're not leaving me. They, they might know, leave you. They're not leaving Joe, me. Joe and I live in the same hometown. He has this uncanny ability about coming by the office and finding out where we're going. And he shows up. You know, I don't know how to yeah, shake him. I'm out. I'm sorry. And this has been going on for seven or eight years. Well, guys, we certainly appreciate being with us and sharing your tips with us. I know that uh, your tips have hopefully helped our audience out there, but we all look forward to hunting with you again next year. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Pleasure. And we want to thank you for joining us today, too. We hope that these tips and suggestions from these guys helped you a little bit, and we've enjoyed having you. And just remember for me, when you have an opportunity, take a child hunting and fishing so they, too, can enjoy the outdoors. We hope to see you next time for more exciting videos coming up on Realtree Outdoors. To find out more about hunting the Osceola turkey, contact the Babcock Ranch at 813-639-3958. If you're interested in hunting the Encinitas Ranch for Rio Grande Gobblers, give Bill Whitfield a call at area code 210-494-6421. For more information on hunting turkeys throughout the beautiful state of Washington, give them a call at 360-902-2200. And for more on Oregon turkey hunting, call the Department of Fish and Wildlife at 503-229-5454, extension 450. Or give the friendly folks at Big K Ranch and Guide Service a holler at 1-800-390-2445. To join the National Wild Turkey Federation and support turkey populations throughout the U.S., call 1-800-T-H-E-N-W-T-F.